Uh, let me again uh, express my thanks for coming to American University and speaking with us about your, your new book. And uh, when uh, David actually asked me to do this, I went to our university library and I checked out many of your works to read them. And uh, what I firstly found was that the constitution of knowledge seems like a continuation of an idea that you began in Kindly Inquisitors. Um, and so I wanted to start there. Uh, this 1993 book that you wrote, kind of around the role of liberal science. So uh, for starting off, how did Kindly Inquisitors describe liberal science and foreshadow, say, today's attacks on free speech and factuality? Well, I have to start by thanking you, Andrew, for moderating, thanking David for making this happen. I see friends in the audience. Professor Tom is here. I couldn't get Jim Thurber to stand up, but 1994, my first big book on politics and government, he was a major source. He's been a friend now, what's that, 30 years. And thank you all for coming today uh, when you have so many other things to do. In 1993, I published a book. It was called Kindly Inquisitor. And it debuted the idea of what I then called, for lack of a better term, liberal science. The notion here is that liberal science is a science that is the science even more important than the other two. It's what I call liberal science. It's a rules-based system for distinguishing as a society what's true, what's false, advancing knowledge, and doing that in a way that is non-authoritarian and non-coercive. And it does that with a couple rules. One is no one gets the final say, so debates can always be open or reopen. There's no such thing as known knowledge that can never again be questioned. A revolutionary change of all truth is open. Even more revolutionary, second rule which the empirical rule, as I called it, which is no merely personal authority. Revelation doesn't count. You have to persuade everybody else using evidence and arguments that anyone can see regardless of their language or their location or their race, their ethnicity, their minority status, or anything else. And this allows you to set up a, a great international system uh, that produces knowledge at a tremendous rate. The second part of the book talked about threats to that. And Maybe that's where we're going, uh, because all of that material turned out 30 years ago, unfortunately, to be still relevant today. Yeah, uh, my, my response when I first read uh, County Inquisitors was kind of, this is before social media was a thing. This is before the mass disinformation that we see in society. And so to see you foreshadowing all of, this in, all of these potentials, even before the, that outbreak was uh, remarkable for me to read. Um, so let's jump right then into the constitution of knowledge, kind of the, like now, several, uh, a few decades later, uh, you are now writing about this uh, uh, kindly inquisitors in, the, in light of our contemporary problems, in, so not just in the United States, but across the globe. Uh, so what is the constitution of knowledge and why is it so important? So I came to think in the period that began in 2016 um, and thereafter when we saw <clears throat> some pretty brazen attacks on, on liberal science, that the first go I had missed something super important, maybe the most important piece of the puzzle, which is in Kindly Inquisitors, I had this, any of you know Karl Popper? Does that name ring a bell? Great philosopher of science, 20th century. And you've all heard the phrase marketplace of ideas, right? So most people are nodding their head. So the notion here is that you set up a marketplace of criticism, and then you throw hypotheses out there. And you have a social process of public criticism. And that surfaces the strongest hypotheses, and that's how we learn. And all of that is right. All of it is good. But it's insufficient, because I realized what we hadn't thought about or wait a minute, markets need rules. So what are the rules? Because it turns out if you don't get the specifications right, if you don't get the parameters and settings right, none of this will work. And we were seeing those parameters and settings break down starting in, I would argue, around 2013, 2014, when the cancel phenomenon begins to be seen, um, and then rapidly accelerating with the Trump MAGA phenomenon, uh, as well as the Putin phenomenon a couple of years after. Uh, and, and I realized that I need to write a book about a big missing link, which was, so, okay, what are the rules that we rely on 
in a peaceful, free, and knowledgeable society to distinguish as a society, collectively, the difference between truth and falsehood. That's the subject of the Constitution of Knowledge. The substance of the Constitution of Knowledge. Uh, should we go to that? Sure. <clears throat> so, mark a place of ideas, uh, great but vague. You need rules. So, what are the rules? Well, I already mentioned two of them. Uh, no final say, no special authority. But you need more than that. You need a system to drive people towards some kind of reality-based consensus. Well, well, where do we see a system in public life that drives decision makers toward consensus? And the answer is the United States Constitution. What that system does is essentially distribute authority in such a way that the only way to get anything done is to compromise with others. That creates a dynamic process where factions have to interact, they have to find allies, bring in new ideas, they can't operate coercively, they have to coordinate. That's the basis of the American Republic. And what I think will be the lasting insight of the Constitution of Knowledge is what I think of as Madisonian epistemology. Constitution of knowledge, unlike marketplace of ideas, is not a metaphor, an analogy, a simile, a literary figure of speech. It is an actual thing. It doesn't have, happen to be written down, but it has all kinds of rules. They are rules like the American Society of Newspaper Editors, rules for how to do journalism, the American Association of University Professors, rules, for academic freedom, the many rules in the government, for example, the Administrative Procedure Act, which uh, does not allow federal agencies, um, bureaucracies, uh, to, to monkey around with truth. They have to go through a fact-finding process, a public process. These are rules which require us, if we're going to make knowledge, to expose our biases to other people and other groups and other identities with other biases and claim a conclusion only in so far as those other people gradually come on board. So it's a great rolling process of consensus. That's the constitution of knowledge. And again, I want to emphasize it's not an abstraction. So I'm trained as a journalist. It took me years of training to learn the to, to learn the rules of how to do journalism right. It's a complicated business. It's even harder if you're Andrew Flores and have to spend years in graduate school and then more years uh, learning and teaching how to follow the very specific detailed rules. And of course, it's what if you're a student here, you're, you're steeped in learning the constitution of knowledge. This is the only system that can generate knowledge on a global scale. It is the only system that can coordinate millions and millions of minds all over the world to, in a matter of days, pivot collectively, but without central coordination to solve a problem like decoding a new virus over the course of a weekend, designing a vaccine over the course of a weekend. It produces more new knowledge literally every morning than in the first 200,000 years of human history. It is growing at an exponential rate as more countries come on. Now the developing world is sending us new scientists and journalists into this system. It is our most important social system, but it's also a vulnerable social system. Yeah. Uh, yes, did you want to elaborate on those vulnerabilities? Funny you should ask. <laughs> if at any point I'm lecturing or hectoring too much, <coughs> cut me off. Um, <clears throat> so, there are two major, there, there, there are three major issues I look at in the Constitution knowledge, three major kind of vulnerabilities. Um, the first and least interesting is the social media ecology. And this is writ large, it's not just social media, it's also Google, it's digital information, um, where fiction spreads faster than truth, and where you've got these finely tuned algorithms that are really good at getting people to click on stuff. Uh, but is not only neutral epistemologically, that is neutral as to truth or falsehood, but it actually accelerates falsehood faster than truth. Um, it's not the first time we've seen technologies like that. The printing press was one, for example, but you know, that set off 100 years, 150 years of warfare. 
Uh, so those technologies are epistemically very challenging. More important, however, in ascending order, um, number two is what's come to be called cancel culture. Um, that's a term that came along while I was still writing the book. I tended to use the word um, coerce conformism. But what this does is manipulate our information systems, for example, our media and especially our social environments to chill and intimidate a lot of people, including majorities of people, such that smaller minorities can seem to dominate the system. And that can be done by, you know, it could be that 70% of people on, on a college campus uh, are against affirmative action, but they're not going to talk about it because they know they could get in trouble with a fairly small group of activists. Well, it turns out if you do this, this has been well known for, for hundreds of years, you can create a false consensus. People no longer know what other people think. They imagine that this one thing that people are either saying publicly and not believing or just keeping silent about is what the majority thinks. That in turn influences what we think. We're very, very subject to influences by what we think others around us think. So this is a sophisticated form of cognitive manipulation. It's very powerful. Um, there's nothing new about it. Alexis de Tocqueville came to America in the, in the 1830s. He said the biggest threat to freedom in America was uh, what he called tyranny of, tyranny of the majority, a majority opinion, which he said could silence anyone who disagreed. <clears throat> so that becomes a form of coercion which distorts the information environment, which can make it very hard to have open, critical conversations at surface knowledge. The biggest worry of all um, is the most audacious and sophisticated and successful campaign of Russian-style disinformation that has ever been waged against the American public, and that's MAGA. Uh, MAGA-based disinformation. Um, we can talk about the politics and policy of Donald Trump and his followers until the cows come home, but we won't. We'll focus specifically on it has again been known for years. This goes back to the time of the czars. Uh, the Nazis were brilliant at manipulating data and information. It turns out if you use some tactics like repetition, hammering away at a point, reversal, no, I'm not, you are. Um, and especially something called fire hose of falsehood disinformation. You can have a profound disruptive effect on the way people think, whether they know what's true or what's false, or whether they even still believe there's a difference between true and false. Fire hose of falsehood, this is a Putin special. The Russians are brilliant at this. Donald Trump is even better. That's where you don't care about truth or falsehood. You don't really necessarily try to deceive anyone, but you throw out so many lies, so many half-truths, exaggeration, conspiracy theories, simultaneously in such high volumes over so many channels that people throw up their hands. They no longer know up from down. They don't know what's true, what's false. Um, Trump initiated this, this in his campaign in 2016. According to PolitiFact, um, which checked both candidate statements in 2016, uh, <clears throat> about a quarter of what Hillary Clinton said that was testable was either mostly or entirely false. Well, that's too high, but maybe it's what you expect from a politician in the heat of a campaign. The equivalent figure for Donald Trump was 70%, 70. If the man opened his mouth on a factual matter, he was probably misstating the truth. And folks, that does not happen by accident. No one in this room could do that even if they tried. <laughs> his first two acts as president literally are to lie about the size of the crowd in his inauguration, when anyone who looked at the pictures could see that he was lying, and to lie about whether it rained during his inauguration, <laughs> when anyone who looked at the weather report or the umbrellas could see he was lying. What's that about? That's not deception. That's about weapons of mass confusion and saying, I'm in charge of the truth now. It can be one thing today, another thing tomorrow. He said employment statistics were rigged under Obama. As soon as he got in, they were solid and sound, that kind of thing. This goes on for four years. Um, 
his checkable lies, a number about 36,000. No one's ever seen anything remotely like that. That's an average of 20 lies a day. But it goes up rapidly in April of and May of 2020. Suddenly that curve goes like that, hockey stick. So anyone know what happened April, May of 2020? Pandemic. Good guess, but not quite what I'm looking for. Remember, stop the steal. In April and May of 2020, Donald Trump begins his attack on mail-in voting. And people like me at Brookings, and maybe people like you in the politics department here go, well, what the hell is he doing? We're in a pandemic. Old people don't want to stand in line to vote. This is going to hurt him, not help him. What we didn't realize was that he was not targeting election day. He was targeting the day after the election. He knew he was likely to lose. And what he was doing was testing the messaging and the networks that he was going to activate the day after the election by creating this campaign of falsehood around the election and escalating it rapidly. And sure enough, the day after the election begins an onslaught of disinformation Unlike anything the U.S. has seen before, the closest parallel I can find is the uh, Southern Secessionist disinformation campaign of the 1850s, which, by the way, did not end well. Um, so we see fire hose of falsehood. We see hundreds of conspiracy theories. No bother for evidence. No bother for consistency. They push him through the courts, 62 court cases, all thrown out, except one slightly partially. That's not because they expect to win lawsuits. They are using the courts as amplifiers of disinformation. Cable news, political networks, leading politicians, and the White House itself in a coordinated campaign that con convinces two thirds of Republicans that the election was stolen and a plurality of independents that will never know the true outcome. So our system was not designed to withstand mass disinformation attacks. They go to the very heart of the Constitution of Knowledge, which is all about behaving in certain ways that screen out this kind of behavior. Yes, and I was actually just going to bounce off the, those, that, that notion in the sense that recent news just revealed that- uh, Fox News. Yes. No. Man. <laughs> you know exactly where I'm going. It's oh, well, I mean, it's, has everyone, everyone seen the, you know, the stuff that's coming out of the, um, the Dominion voting system lawsuit against Fox News. So you, you probably don't need a description. Yeah, what we're learning is what we already knew, but, but now we have documentary proof that Fox News was not in the news business. It was in the propaganda business. Um, it was attracting eyeballs. Now, I'm a journalist by profession, and I can tell you that in a real journalistic organization, Anyone who goes out there and knowingly prints false stuff is in very serious trouble. CNN fired four senior journalists for getting a story wrong. Uh, Trump, of course, said that just proves they're fake news. No, it proved they were real news. What Fox is doing is, again, unprecedented, and that's the biggest single news outlet in the country, so-called news outlet. Right, and, uh, and so, and of course, they're, therefore, kind of, violating, uh, say, the central tenets of the Constitution of Knowledge, the idea that there should be some kind of check, this organizational journalistic check on these systems, uh, at least for journalists, in terms of the appropriate way of behavior. Uh, and what exactly. happens if there are no, say, potential enforcement mechanisms? Or, or are there ways in which, say, the journalistic industry can rein in uh, these individuals? Well, we, we did it before. I shouldn't say we. It was a long time ago. Um, but um, this is not the first time we face versions of these problems. In fact, they've gone on for, for hundreds of years, um, uh, way back to the printing press, arguably even before. But American journalism in the 19th century, as many of you know, was a cesspool of hyper-partisanship and fake news. They made stuff up. If any of you... Does the name H.L. Mencken ring a bell? Arguably the greatest journalist of his time. If you read his memoirs, Happy Days, wonderful book. He talks about being a young reporter uh, in Baltimore and um, 
what they would do, the reporters, for the three or four newspapers they had then, was get together at the bar at night and make up stories. And they discovered if they coordinated it, so the details were the same in all the newspapers, they never actually had to do any reporting. <laughs> and Mencken, this is the 1890s, he thinks this is hilarious. What could be more fun? Um, and this stuff was absolutely rampant. But it became toxic to the readership. It became a race to the bottom. And even some of the worst press barons, like Hearst and Pulitzer, realized that they were creating a toxic environment for their readers. <clears throat> in around, I think it's what, the early 20 or so, the, um, we, we get the formation of institutions. Actually, they start a bit earlier. We start to see journalism schools, which begin inculcating norms like accuracy. We see the foundation of the American Society of News Editors, newspaper editors, uh, which lives on today as the News Leaders Association. And in the 20s, they sit down and formulate ethics guidelines for journalists. And you can look them up. They're very short, but they say things like be accurate and run corrections, things we all take for granted today. Well, someone had to come up with that. Uh, and then you see the adoption of those rules. You see the inculcation of those rules. So by the, eight, by the 1940s, we're beginning to enter the golden age of mainstream media. We've got, you know, we've gotten from William Randolph Hearst to Edward R. Murrow in just over a generation. So that's how you fight this. You need to create institutional guardrails, which people then inculcate as norms. And that's what you're doing here at AU and in every great university in the world. You are, you are transmitting and developing those values. Every time anyone in this group um, writes a footnote, a citation, saying here's the providence of that idea, here's where I got it, here's how you can check it. They're following the constitution of knowledge. Show your work, be accurate. It takes years to inculcate that. It takes only, it turns out, a months to wear it down. So the question today becomes, in places like social media and the electorate and in news media, can we begin to rebuild standards and safeguards? And that's, that is a hard question. It is a very hard question, especially as you <laughs> mentioned recent, uh, earlier about what motivates, say, uh, Google or other types of industry to show you the content that you're exposed to, right? And that yes. their motivation may not necessarily be accuracy of information, but to get the clicks, right, in order to get more traffic. Um, and so in your book, you actually talk about maybe potential avenues of off-ramps from uh, 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 these, these silos that people can build, or these, these patterns that technology can build for misinformation. Uh, so, and one I wanted, to talk to, wanted you to elaborate more on was just like the example of Wikipedia. Uh, and how Wikipedia serves as like an, an example of maybe a good practice of internet-based uh, constitution of knowledge. Yeah, which is exactly what it is. I, I did a dive into Wikipedia. How many of you use Wikipedia? Wait, I should ask it differently. How many of you don't use Wikipedia? <laughs> a hand went up. I would like to come back to you and find out why later in this conversation. Um, so. People said you will never be able to have an accurate, uh, disaggregated, contributory encyclopedia. It'll be full of junk. And in fact, that's true in the entire rest of the internet. How did Wikipedia do it? Well, when I explored the rules that Wikipedia uses, and there are a lot of rules, it turns out that what they're doing, knowingly or not, is replicating a lot of the same rules that the constitution of knowledge uses in the sciences and in journalism. Stuff like show your work. You've got to have citations. Distinguish more and less accurate sources. So credentialing becomes important. Every page has editors. And then there are other editors who are kind of almost semi-professional. No one is really paid, but these are people who have long track records at Wikipedia. Other people are overseeing those editors, and there's even one level higher than that of people who are watching these things. So every page is watched. And here's something they do, which is so crucial, because it is, it's also the single step that makes universalism possible in science. And that's the great breakthrough of science, right? Science is the same all over the world, in principle, if we do it right. Um, Wikipedia has only one page for every subject. Of course, that's not true on Facebook. No two people see the same feed, right? Twitter, Google, 
All of them are presenting different people with different realities, so it's fragmented. In fact, no one even knows what anyone's seeing on Facebook because Facebook doesn't tell us and may not even know itself. Wikipedia requires, because there's only one page, everyone can look at it and check it. So you've now got people all over the world sharing the same reality, checking each other. What does that sound like? Political science here at AU. You publish a paper, anyone can read it and check it. You better be prefer, prepared if, if an academic in India says, you know, you've got your data wrong. Um, so Wikipedia shows that in principle, digital media can be, can be harnessed. Um, it is difficult, of course, with social media, which has a very different purpose than Wikipedia or search engines. The good news is that over the past few years, social media organizations have done a lot of work to try to make themselves more truth friendly. A very interesting example of that's Facebook's oversight board. Any of you know about that? They've created a committee separate from Facebook to, to, to rule on what can and cannot be on Facebook, what the rules are going to be, try to make that transparent. That's exactly the same kind of boundary setting, rule setting operation that we saw 100 years ago for journalism. Um, you have Google, which has integrated its search engines with fact checkers. So uh, they don't kick stuff off of Google. But if something is fact checked, especially on a controversial subject, it'll appear higher. And then they'll tell you who the fact checkers are and how they did it. <clears throat> Twitter was beginning to work on this until Elon Musk happened, and that's another story. <laughs> or maybe just a related story, because you know, I am thinking about yeah. the downsizing of big tech and how maybe some of these safeguards might actually be, that are in their infancy, begin to actually start to weaken. Um, um, yeah, it's a paradox, isn't it? Because on the one hand, bigness makes these systems vulnerable to mass disinformation very quickly, and you want to have more. Um, you know, one great advantage of our university structure is, you know, there's so many places, there's so many nodes. If one university or department or person gets it wrong, other people can, can come in and correct that. On the other hand, it is very hard for lots of little outlets to, to sustain behavioral norms, right? So uh, if, if, if Twitter goes away and you see a dozen much smaller outlets, they all drift off into their separate realities, potentially. So these problems are really hard. It's not that we haven't made any headway, it's that these are really hard problems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And to connect this all back to this, the broader populace, if people are receiving their own information streams, their own perceptions of reality, it can be really easy for people to get into their own, per se, echo chambers, um, and then therefore think that their position is right, others is in absolutely incorrect, uh, but then never have an opportunity to engage in dialogue. I just wanted to see if you wanted to expand upon uh, those ideas to kind of think about how this actually relates to deliberation and governance. Yeah, gladly. Um, you know, it reminds me of Marjorie Taylor Greene saying, it's impossible that Joe Biden won. No one I know supported him. <laughs> <clears throat> so uh, this is such an important question. If I hope I won't filibuster, but if I sort of take a slightly higher altitude approach. So human beings, why do we need a constitution of knowledge to begin with? Why don't we just go out and find the truth? Well, it turns out that human beings are not really very well wired when it comes to finding abstract truth. We're pretty good on, is that a tiger in the bush or only a breeze? Or where can I find water? Or where's the next tribe camped? Where we get immediate feedback and it affects our own lives. But on abstract questions like who do we worship, what is the cause of the disease that's killing our children, we're terrible. Like, you're a witch. You gave, you, you're giving the children an evil eye, we kill you. That's the solution. Um, we're terribly prone to biases of every kind. We are not conscious of our biases. Being intelligent makes it worse, not better, because it makes us better at rationalizing our biases. We're also biased by the people around us. We're very easy to influence. Um, cognitive psychology has demonstrated this to a fairly well over almost 100 years. So if other people believe things, we tend to believe it too. Um, we tend to believe because we're seeking esteem, self-esteem or status within our group. Um, and all of this 
add to the fact that we hate to be exposed to disagreeing viewpoints. So we naturally form these little tribes of belief and then we go to war with each other and we have constant chaos and we have no advance of knowledge and we have coercion and authoritarianism and that's the first 200,000 years. Constitution of knowledge, the way it's like the US Constitution is it forces us out of our bubbles. Madison's great insight, Federalist number 10, some of you have, I know at least two of you have read that, three of you. So Madison comes along and says, the greatest danger to a democracy is the ambitious politician or faction that wants to take control and can do that. And he says, there's only one force that is strong enough to contain the force of ambition. So anyone, what is the one force that contains ambition? I know you know it, but professors, professors are shouting it out. Do any students know the answer? I like the ambition of others. Yeah. Um, must be a politics major. <laughs> yeah. You harness ambition to counter ambition. So you create checks and balances. So in order to get anything done, you're going to have to get other ambitious, strong-willed, disagreeing people to go along with it, which means you're going to have to compromise. And that's going to be a dynamic process that introduces new ideas. And no one gets their way all the time, but we all in this rolling process <laughs> live to, to fight another day. And we suddenly turn the danger to any republic, the deadly danger, into its greatest asset. This is why I think Madison was an alien from outer space. He didn't get there all by himself, but he's the guy who figured this out well enough to write it down and put it in a constitution. Constitution of knowledge does the same thing a different way. It forces us out of our bubbles. It says, look, it doesn't matter how certain I feel. It doesn't matter if God told me. It doesn't matter if my life experience allows me you know, to say things, gives me a perspective no one else shares. If I cannot convince other people with different biases that I'm right, I can't make knowledge. That forces me to go and encounter people like Jim Thurber, who think I'm completely wrong, and tell me that, and make my case. Uh, or I publish an article, and they publish another article. They say, well, you know, Roush doesn't have it all right. And we begin this rolling dialogue, which becomes a multinational, multi-ethnic, multicultural, multi-everything global conversation producing truth. And it's all about forcing us out of those cognitive bubbles. So what cancelers are out to do, and what trolls are out to do, and disinformation is disrupt that process by substituting noise for signal, that's mass disinformation, or by allowing small minorities to cabin what the rest of us can say, thus interrupting this process. Sorry about the, the long answer. I feel self-conscious about that, but. <laughs> I know, I, I think it's great. Um, and, um, and really what grounds kind of your thoughts are is like an adherence to this Madisonian principle around pluralism. And that yeah, any exactly. system that tries to pursue homogenization of a, of a group or of a population can, is antithetical to, say, the constitution of knowledge. Whenever anyone's saying, I have the right answer, you're wrong, and I'm going to shut you up or shut you down. Or they can say, you know, it makes me feel emotionally unsafe to hear your point of view. They are shutting down this process so that produces talk, peace and knowledge. Yeah, let's talk about this distinction you have uh, between the cancel culture notion that you discuss in the book, as well as like its distinctions from, say, criticism, um, and how they, those two uh, are different from one another. So um, criticism is the process of subjecting ideas to, to critical, usually rational examination in a process oriented toward seeking truth. Canceling is a process of destroying the reputations or livelihoods of those you disagree with in order to uh, seize and maintain political power. Their ends are exactly the opposite of one another because criticism is about forcing people into contact with views that are different in order to advance knowledge. <coughs> Canceling is about suppressing views that are different in order to impose your own view on others. Um, they are very different epistemologically. However, in practice, they can often look kind of similar. 
because criticism gets very fierce. You know, this guy Flores, he, he doesn't know squat. He's barely even doing political science in this article. It's just wish casting. Um, who gave him his doctorate? Now, most scientists don't behave that way, but occasionally it happens. There are these flame wars in science that start to look like canceling. And then there are things that go on in the public discourse, like with the cartoonist Scott Adams right now, is that his name, Dilbert? Where it's pretty hard to tell what's going on there. Is that really canceling? Well, so I approach this by um, laying out six or seven diagnostic factors uh, that distinguish um, canceling from criticism. And I won't try to list them all. But there are things like, is it an organized campaign? Are a bunch of us trying to go after Flores to get him fired uh, or lose his tenure or write an apology? Um, are we lying about what the other person is saying? We're refusing even to read it. I don't need to read Flores' article because I know it's racist. Uh, or if I'm saying things that are not even in the article. Um, am I targeting the person punitively rather than the idea? <clears throat> I'm not saying Flores has this hypothesis wrong. I'm saying this guy should never work again. Uh, a big one, secondary boycotts. Cancelers don't just go after the immediate target. They go after anyone who sympathizes or supports the target. You remember this all from the McCarthy era, right? You not only go after the supposed homosexual or communist, you go after anyone who defended them. That's what happens in canceling. That's how you can take an individual target. I go after Flores, but I'm not just targeting him because everyone else knows if I put my head above the parapet, these other people, then they'll get shot off. That's how small minorities can dominate large conversations. And there are two or three more like that. When you go through them all, it turns out it's usually pretty darn easy to tell if a campaign is about uh, using social coercion, manipulating the social environment to silence people, or if what you're trying to do is advance knowledge by criticizing an, an idea. Usually it's actually pretty obvious. So, and I, I, I have several reactions to, of course, your, your thoughts in the book around those topics. But one thing that stuck out to me, especially as a scholar of um, marginalized groups and communities, uh, was this notion that, uh, that canceling or silencing of groups can actually strike and cut pretty hard against marginalized communities. And that free speech may actually be very important for those groups in order to even begin to articulate their, their struggles. Did that resonate with you? It did. <laughs> um, so that's good because that's the hardest thing that I'm struggling with now as I talk about these issues. And the biggest emotional heartbreak for me as I talk about these issues. So um, I'm, I'm intersectional. I am an atheistic homosexual Jew. Atheists are the last group that the, the public still refuses to consider uh, could be president. Um, homosexuals, of course, had a terrible history. I was born in 1960. It was most states uh, threatened us with arrest in our homes. They use those laws to, uh, to, to entrap us, get us fired. We, canceling was invented, refined on gay people. Um, and I'm a Jew. And my grandmother's siblings, two or three of them, died in the, in the awfulness in Europe. Um, I was very active in the campaign for gay marriage and the campaign for gay equality. Gay is, you know, what we called it then. It was before LGBTQ. And we had nothing. Um, we did not have votes. So we were a pariah class. We did not have money. We did not have public support. We were pariahs. We were faggots. We were queers. We were inverts, perverts. The government referred to us as perverts. We couldn't work for the government. We couldn't be in the military. Of course, we couldn't get married. Um, how did we cope with this? By using freedom of speech by confronting the other side again and again with arguments that they were wrong. That is how in 1973, the American Psychiatric Association, a few years too late, but they overturned the psychiatric profession's official designation that homosexuality was a mental illness, a diagnosis which had caused unheard of harm to gay people, especially youth. I mean. Alan Turing, raise your hand if you've heard that name. If you haven't, ask Professor Flores about it later. People were lobotomized, 
right here, St. Elizabeth's Hospital, 10 miles from here. Um, we fought this by confronting the people who had the bad ideas with the truth. Most of them were not haters. They thought they were saving the country from the wrath of God, from um, people who were trying to subvert the US government, from a medical disease, from the recruitment of children. We did this with our voices primarily. And yes, it took a while. And yes, it was a pain to have to educate America. And no, we're not entirely the way there yet. But wow, we are, I, I am now married to a man for 13 years in the District of Columbia and, and eight years under federal law. I would never have believed growing up that this was possible. And this is all because we were able to make our arguments under the Constitution of Knowledge. So to see now a plurality uh, among younger people, a majority of people say that free speech harms marginalized communities and should be suppressed for that reason, just breaks my heart. It could not be more historically wrong. It could not be more harmful to minorities. The notion that somehow we're too fragile to confront people with false and bigoted opinions, give me a break. You know, we, we confronted them before breakfast every day and we won those confrontations. That's how we got here. So to claim that we're somehow too weak and need protection is so infantilizing, that's marginalizing. So yeah, um, the, the trend on campuses now to view <clears throat> real robust dialogue and people saying things which could be wrongheaded um, and sometimes outrageous. Uh, the, the trend to shut that down, I think, is, is just terrible for marginalized communities. And what it will do is entrench privileged orthodoxies um, in positions where they won't be questioned and where people will get hurt. Ignorance is, is, is our number one enemy. Um, I, David, I think I'm at time for the mm -hmm. floor. A couple, if you want, like one more question. Well, I'd like to hear your reaction to what I just said. I think you're a generation younger. I'm about to turn 63. I, I'm guessing you're not there yet. Yeah. <laughs> uh, like, like I said, I have several scribbled notes, um, and uh, um, so, and I definitely have various points of view about about the, the argument. Like I said, to a degree, there is definitely some element of the argument that I have. Uh, um, uh, I agree with one of the first cases against that kind of affirm the rights of LGBTQ people in the United States was a free speech case. Um, and so just being having the right to assembly, the right to even mail your own leaflets to other people was the beginning yeah. of what started to create a culture in order to begin resistance. We couldn't do that until 1958. So, but, you know, and then also at the same time to recognize that, and one thing that I think is in the constitution of knowledge as a reaction is this notion that there is decentralized networks and no necessary central authority, right, over what constitutes knowledge. And that's a kind of radical egalitarianism that sort of assumes that there is a, a, a level power sharing playing field. And one thing as a political scientist that I'm interested in, right, is power and the stratification that power can produce. And so what I think about when I think about the constitution of knowledge is that it's a great idea that I'm wondering if I put a lens of power and inequality there and take an analysis from that point perspective, what are, I, I might, I think there are certain critiques within that document that I would definitely critique. Um, I, I know I'm speaking more abstract, but I'm just saying that I, um, like the notion of, um, there, you have a slight discussion toward the end around postmodern. So you, you appreciate the modern theorists and liberal theorists, but there's a lot of postmodern theory that gets developed from since then, right? Critical legal studies, feminist theory, intersectionality. And, and those, uh, for some, those ideas are kind of like no one person's understanding of reality can't be separate from their own subjectivity, right? And that, um, and there have been responses to say, what is truth to say that there might be uh, um, more than one truth per se, right? Uh, which you think of as antithetical to um, the constitution of knowledge. Uh, but what I sometimes think of is like when Kimberly Crenshaw coined the term of intersectionality is that there might be blind spots in our knowledge if we perform an analysis of identities 
uh, on a single axis that might, there might be new knowledge that gets revealed. That is still truth by taking on multiple intersecting layers of identity at the same time. So, um, so I think those ideas, those theories are still part of our discussion of what is truth um, and part of the dialogue and part of the, of the debate. And, and, and so, and so yeah, so that's, I guess that's, those are my general thought reactions to, the, to your thoughts there. Uh, well, uh, we, we're diving pretty deep there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so there, there are various directions that, that we could go with that. One would be the what is truth question. Um, the, the definition, that, the, the concept that I use for that in the Constitution of Knowledge, uh, the best answer I've heard is Popper's answer, which is truth is not a destination, it's a direction. Uh, you don't assume that you've ever got there, but it's like north or up. It's a, it's a, it's a regulatory concept. Um, what we can define more precisely is objective knowledge, and that's what we're talking about today. That's what do we think collectively uh, is today the, the closest approximation to truth that we have, knowing that we're always wrong about lots of things and we always have further to go. Objective knowledge is a series of propositions which have been validated socially in some way, and I argue the right way to do that is the constitution of knowledge because all the other ways are abusive, authoritarian, ignorant, and warlike. So um, one of the things that's puzzled me about the intersectionality arguments is it seems to me those are the best arguments for the, the liberal science concept, the market, uh, the, the constitution of knowledge, because no two people have the same perspective. And even individually, we have multiple identities, right? Um, we're, we're multiple things. And so how do you get maximum inclusion for maximum uh, perspectives? Well, the answer to that is you create a system that forces all of these identities, biases, individuals, and factions into conversation with each other. Um, and you then force them to obey the same rules. And instead of just having you know, two identities, maybe white and black or male and female, suddenly you've, you're harnessing a world's worth of diversity. Viewpoint diversity, so there are three things the Constitution of Knowledge needs in order to function. One is free speech, which we've <coughs> talked about. Second is the discipline of fact. You know, you don't make stuff up. Uh, all, of this, all of the things that go into academic and scholarly and journalistic and lawyerly rigor. And the third is diversity of viewpoint. In a room where everyone agrees you cannot make new knowledge because there won't be anyone to test and challenge the assumptions. The best proof against any one perspective, uh, taking control, exerting power, is to have all of that diversity involved. So it seems to me obvious the Constitution of Knowledge is the way to go if what you want is diversity and if what you want is to avoid the use of raw power in knowledge decision making. That's great. So, <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and, and, and switch things now. And, and as I said, I'm going to start off with a question. I actually was going to defer it, but you actually provided a nice segue for me, uh, which is uh, about viewpoint diversity. <laughs> and I wonder the, the degree to which you are, are concerned or, or generally what your thoughts are regarding the, the growth um, and, and lack of viewpoint diversity within uh, the, the, sources, the traditional sources of informational authority, uh, be it academia, journalism, uh, et cetera. So uh, everyone knows Professor Barker. Mm -hmm. And this was, I, we didn't plan this, but, but that was the ideal softball question. Um, <laughs> because one of the things that most worries me about academia, to a lesser extent, journalism, is the lack of viewpoint diversity. Obviously, American mainstream media got caught up short in the 2016 election because so few people were in touch with the parts of America that turned out to be Trump voters. Um, the biggest problem with lack of viewpoint diversity, uh, however, is in academia. And this, alas, is now well documented by study after study that shows um, there are lots of still a fair number of conservative and moderate students on campus, but a lot of them are intimidated about speaking up. There is just another big new detailed study on that University of Wisconsin system, but there are many. A lot of people who are not of the left are keeping their heads down, staying silent. This creates what are called spirals of silence, where it appears that minorities that have the most vocal opinions 
dominate the landscape because everyone else is keeping silent and no one else is sure what anyone else thinks. So that's a problem among students. Among faculty, in some disciplines and some departments, especially in the social sciences and humanities, you have virtually no one who is not quite left wing. It is now possible in many oh, universities. On, center left. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I had, this was the most heartbreaking interview I did for my book. A, a, a student at one of the, a famous liberal arts college that you've heard of, um, telling me that one of her real regrets in college is that she had not been exposed to a full range of, of viewpoints from left to right. Students say this, by the way, they want more diversity. They want more controversial <coughs> speakers. They want to hear more from conservatives. Um, and she, but she said, but you know, when I think about it, I get some solace from knowing that at least I've had the full range of progressive viewpoints. <laughs> I thought, ah, oh, that is so wrong. Um, so it's now possible, you guys tell me out there if you think I'm wrong about this, but it is easily possible in, in dis certain disciplines and many departments to go your entire career in academia without ever encountering a center to center right point of view. Undergraduate, graduate school, thesis, dissertation, defense, associate, fall, right on to retirement, you can live in a bubble. That's not only going to attract the kind of attention that it is attracting from Governor DeSantis in the Florida legislature, which is toxic to, to academic freedom. It's also toxic to the scientific enterprise because it means this whole side of questions is not getting asked. In fact, it's stigmatized to challenge a lot of these dogmas. That is the opposite of the diversity that Madison relies on in the Constitution um, and that John Locke relies on in the Constitution of knowledge. Diversity is the source of knowledge. You have to be open to multiple points of view. And you cannot claim the right to shut down those points of view because they make you feel unsafe, which is the latest. The history is replete with reasons to shut down dissident and unorthodox point of views. That's just the latest. Do you feel comfortable taking your own questions? Else? Yeah, sure, whatever you guys want to do. Sir? Yeah, um, you mentioned some of the- Could you like, um, just let us know who you are? Yeah, my name is Brody. I'm a, one of professor students. Thank you for coming today. I really appreciate it. Do you get Thank credit? You for the question. <laughs> of course. <laughs> um, so following some of your theories about you know liberal science and then also Madisonian epistemology, I had a very quick question about if you think some of the theories and um, the constitution of knowledge, these types of things, can be superimposed on other democracies like a lot of our friends in Europe that sort of thing, or does it really follow around like the um, like a control variable or a nexus that is the Constitution of the United States? Definitely global. Um, U.S. Constitution um, <coughs> is only in the United States, so the principles we see embodied in other democracies. Constitution of knowledge is our first and greatest truly global enterprise. I mean, this thing manages to coordinate undirected yet coherent learning activity, science, journalism, even law is now international, all over the world. Millions of minds, thousands and thousands of institutions in a network in constant touch with each other so that if Professor Flores comes up with a study that challenges a core fact and is proof right, that's gonna pulse out through the whole network globally. And everyone else, sooner or later, is gonna have to, ch have to take that on board. So. It is, a, it is a global network. Um, I make a strong claim for liberal science. You tell me if you think this is right. Um, but the claim is that this is a transformative, a species transforming technology. Because this technology takes small tribes of people, maybe 150 each, who basically go on tradition and authority and learn a little <coughs> bit maybe, but not very much over 200,000 years. And it allows us to function one to two orders of magnitude above our design capacity by creating what amounts to this global hive mind in which any individual can only know the most minuscule part yet somehow can be part of this vast coordinated whole. So yeah, ultra global. I, I completely agree. 
I'm afraid that we'll lose it, though, as fast as we've gained it. So uh, if you all heard that, that, we might lose it as fast as we gain it. So you know, here's something I never, tired of say I never tire of saying, I wish I didn't have to, um, but it is, it is true. The three things that, that are essential, freedom of speech, the discipline of fact, and diversity of viewpoint, are antithetical to human instinct. They are the most counterintuitive system ever designed. Think about free speech. The idea that not only should the government tolerate views that are blasphemous, offensive, um, bigoted, plain wrong, should not only tolerate those views, but should actively protect them is the most counterintuitive social idea of all time, bar none, and totally ridiculous and indefensible, except for the fact that it turns out also to be the most successful single social idea of all time. But because these principles are so counterintuitive, because people by nature hate to confront disconfirming viewpoints, because diversity of opinion alarms us because it challenges us, we are going to have to get up, me and you, and then your kids and their kids are going to have to get up every morning for the rest of their lives, for the rest of human history, and defend this whole system from scratch. And it's always going to have opponents, and they'll always seem to have compelling reasons why we should shut up somebody or silence somebody or use misinformation, whatever it happens to be. And they'll always come up with new ways to do it and new reasons. The, the good news is we've done pretty well. Uh, it's, what you see today is a huge challenge, but it's not the first. Um, so the answer is that we just get up every morning and we do it, and we're, we, we need to be cheerful about it. So that's your job. <laughs> Thank you. Way in the back? Sure. The one right here in the front. OK, Your let's choice. go first to the back, then the front, and then over here. OK. We got the next three. So it's a, I, think, I think what you're asking, Maxwell, is the question of trust. How do you establish trust in this system? And that is, of course, a great problem. And trust is exactly what is being targeted now on the left and the right. Um, the the reality-based community, that's what I call academia and uh, the research and academia communities, journalism, government and law, all are reality-based. They can't make stuff up. Um, they're all expert communities. Um, we rely on professionals to tell us the weather, uh, to figure out what's news and what isn't. Um, we rely on them to do law um, and so forth. And the question is, can those professionals ma maintain trust that they're doing their job with integrity? And two things make that difficult right now. One, which is not their fault, is the massive sustained attack on uh, epistemic authority that goes back now, starts in the 60s on the left, but then it picks up on the right big time with Rush Limbaugh and what he calls the four horsemen of deceit, which are, let's see, science, government, journalism, and one other. He says, you can't believe any of them. Donald Trump says, don't believe the, what you read in the paper. Believe what I tell you. The other is our fault. And that's when mainstream journalism loses that sense of diversity, which allows it to question um, assumptions. Or now here we get to the heart of this and other institutions. When academic institutions begin defining their mission as something more like a political goal than an epistemic goal, which is to say, are we advancing social justice? Are we requiring statements of support for equity um, in order to get hired, and so forth? That severely reduces trust. Um, I think it's important to do everything we can to reestablish trust and show that we're on the level. And 
That's something that each institution will have to do in its own way. Alas, I think of the four major pillars of the reality-based community, government law, um, journalism and academia, academia is doing the worst job right now um, of self-policing. We're seeing signs things are changing. We've seen like the Academic Freedom Alliance has arisen. We've seen the Stanford faculty got together just, I guess, two weeks ago and push back against an effort by administrators to create a list of words you could and couldn't say on campus. They said, oh, no, you don't. And I thought, yeah, that's good. Um, so pushing back to maintain the integrity of these institutions is, actual, is, is crucial. And, and each of you can play a role. Every, every person in this room who is a member of the AU community can play a role by being an outspoken advocate of the Constitution of Knowledge. I have a question? Yeah. Um, I'm Charlie Leoka, and I run, a, I guess, the largest consumer advocacy group for travelers in the country. And, but uh, this has nothing to do with travel, but I was, I'd just like to present something where I was recently in a. Could, could you do it in the form of a short question? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to. We've got others who want to. Uh, it's going, going to be. I was in a, a movie group, and the movie that we watched was called One Man's Hero, <clears throat> and that's the end of the day. And then the rest of the story was, is another man's traitor? And it raised the question of um, who do you really belong to? Who do you follow? Do you follow your religion? Do you follow your country? Do you follow your new country? Do you follow your orders? And so on. And when it presented everything like that and, and it ended, I asked the people, and we were having the discussion, I said, how many of you have ever been in the military? And I was with a whole group of people in D.C. Not one single person has been in the military. They have no idea of what uh, following or, or being true to their partners are. And then I said, how many people have ever played football? Not one person ever played football. It's another thing where you do your job could, and could someone you else the does question, theirs. Please. But, but I just wanted to know if you, when you look at the society and you look at it in terms of being teams or tribes or so on, what, what do you see? Do you see um, people like a football team where everybody's doing their job? They're not worried about catching the ball. They're just worried about blocking. Or do you see that as a, uh, how does that fit into the picture of, of your justice or your uh, constitution system? Um, so constitution of knowledge, like the US Constitution, is a way of coordinating diversity and uh, forcing people in order to get something, in order to get what they want to accommodate others. Um, and it's based on the premise that it's very hard to get people to agree and coordinate. And in fact, you want them to bring the energy of disagreement to what they're doing. You don't want them to walk into the room agreeing with each other. You want them to walk in disagreeing, even passionately. Um, so the question to me isn't, will people ever agree? Will we ever automatically be on the same team? It's can we preserve the structures, the rules, the norms that we agree to within our other disagreements that force us to do business with each other? And those are under serious strain right now. Um, you all probably, it's a separate conversation, but you all know how polarized society is. Polarization and propagandization are two sides of the same coin. That's why Putin is so intent, what he was doing in 2016, was trying to divide Americans against each other. That's why they fomented these, these rallies uh, on opposite sides of issues across the street from each other. Um, the more you divide a society, the more vulnerable it is to propaganda saying those other people are out to get you and the weaker as a society we become. If I could wave a magic wand and do one thing to make America healthier as a culture um, and to reduce polarization and a vulnerability to propaganda, it would be to make America, make the Congress effective again as a brokering system uh, for different factions. It's the only institution in the country that brings all Americans together in a place where they can do business and hammer things out on hard issues like abortion and immigration, 
And when it does not do that, no one else can. And we, we get more divided. And all of these other problems that we've been talking about get worse. One final last question. There, I'd like it to be from a, a woman, if we OK, there, there was, was there one, one person here? who had his hand up a long time in the front row, but oh, maybe so. he subsided. Wait, I think you've earned it. Thank you. <laughs> um, my name is Radhika. We met earlier. Um, Going back to the topic of cancel culture, I was wondering um, if it's, or at least if you've seen um, rising prevalence in the current climate of people perhaps misconstruing criticism as um, belonging to cancel culture, um, almost um, in an effort to silence, um, like you essentially made the argument that can cancel culture will sil tends to silence um, majority opinion in the favor of um, upholding like um, a more powerful minority. But in many cases, um, if a minority t uh, attempts to speak out um, or just any member of a marginalized group attempts to speak out, um, their, uh, their opinion, um, even especially if it comes from like, you know, a, a rightfully passionate background, uh, can can be mislabeled or dismissed as uh, stemming from cancel culture rather than as like a genuine criticism of um, a hateful idea. Yeah, uh, thank you. Super important point. Um, so yeah, it's possible to abuse labels like cancel culture and turn that into a way to silence each other. Or as um, Jesse Single has put it, uh, we all need to start canceling the cancelers who are canceling the cancelers. <laughs> then you can go on you know, in an infinite regression this way. And that's why you need some fairly, some objective boundaries. And that's what my book, The Constitution of <coughs> Knowledge, tries to do. It says, wait a minute, folks. There are some rules about right and wrong ways to do things within this culture. Uh, and they include stuff like, for example, depends on, on what someone's doing. If, if I am attacking Professor Flores's idea, even quite ferociously, I don't think he's entitled to say he's being canceled. If, on the other hand, I am attacking his job and saying because he tweeted out something, um, he should be fired, then I am canceling him because I'm going after the person and not the idea. <clears throat> if I'm giving a truthful account of what Professor Flores has said in debunking him, that's a sign I'm on the level. If I am making up stuff that he didn't say or stripping the context or taking a single word in a single tweet, and using that to denounce him, regardless of his entire previous record um, of not believing that, then again, I'm acting in bad faith. Um, so what I hope my book does, did I mention I have a book out? <laughs> and it's, it can be yours on for Amazon sale. for the low price of, can be yours today, right? Yeah, it can be. Um, I think we're, we're making them available after this. Yeah, Is yeah, that right? yeah. So the whole point of the book is to try to say, you know, we, we're not at sea in this vast war of world, of, of words, where everyone's claiming anything and we don't know what's true and what's false and we don't know whose claims are legitimate and whose aren't. There's 300 years of carefully crafted institutions and norms and rules that guide us in all these decisions and we can look at our conduct and our institutions and saying, are we doing this the way we're supposed to be doing it? Now, of course, there are always edge cases. Constitution of knowledge, the reality-based community is always arguing about itself. Any scientist or academic in this room will tell you there are constant arguments about, so is Barker over here, is, is this new methodology, is this really science? Or is this wish casting? <laughs> the peanut gallery over there. So of course, we're going to argue within the reality-based community about where the rules are. But that's the whole point. We have a structure to do that. If we protect that structure, we protect our sense of being grounded in reality. And, and reality right now in America, a shared reality, is under threat. Way to end it. Thanks. Thank you all. <laughs>